afternoon, everyone. I'm Cinder Rushton. I am uh, co chair of the Johns Hopkins Hospital Ethics Committee, Consultation Service, and faculty member is to do my bioethics. Welcome to Ethics for Lunch. Um, this is a ongoing uh, forum that we have to engage our community of issues that are of interest and concern to us to create opportunity to look at them together and hopefully to uh, understand what some of the ethical issues and challenges are in the work that we do every day. Uh, there is an activity code for today. Uh, it's 15067 if you need to get credit for being here. Uh, take advantage of that. And without further ado, I'm going to turn over today's program to our moderator, Dr. Maggie Moon, to uh, help facilitate conversation about responsible innovation in pediatric surgery. So, Maggie. Thanks, everybody. And it's so nice to see this group of people here because I'm really looking forward to a conversation today about what we mean by responsible innovation in pediatric surgery, how we as a, as a hospital community should be addressing it and communicating with each other about it. So um, I'm Maggie Moon. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of the Children's Center and faculty <coughs> at the Department of Institute of Bioethics. And also on the Ethics Committee with Cinda and Mark and many other people in the room. So uh, for several years, I was on the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Bioethics. And, and that committee published a statement just recently about responsible innovation in children's surgical care. And reading it, it made me want to know what we thought as an institution about some of the issues that they raised. And so I'm just going to open by explaining why I think it's such an important problem. When we talk about innovation in pediatric surgery, it's, it's really interesting idea that innovation is sort of, it's, it's uncertainty. It's operating in the arena of uncertainty. And because it's uncertainty, there's hope and there's challenge. And communicating effectively about that hope and that challenge and the risk with ourselves, with our patients, with our families, is really an issue of tremendous concern. When I think about, though, the importance of innovation, like the easiest thing is to say, well, let's just follow standard of care. Let's not innovate. But that's not what Hopkins is all about. Hopkins is about innovation. Innovation is, is what we do, and we do it for really great reasons. If you think of the history of medicine, all the important changes that have made because people in this institution have been willing to take the risk of innovation, it's really incredibly remarkable. That said, it remains incredibly risky and challenging. So we have a wonderful panel of people here today who see innovation from several different perspectives. What I'm going to do is open this to them and sort of see if we can focus on some of the questions of sort of why we bother to innovate, why it means so much to us, what it means to our families, and how we address this, uh, specific issues of innovation with our families. What's the difference about parents deciding about innovation for a pediatric patient for an infant and compared to a, a, an adult deciding about innovation to innovative therapy for themselves? I think that really adds to the richness of what we're trying to get done here in the children. Another question that we may come up or may discuss is the incredible resource allocation devoted to innovation, innovative therapy at some point. It's an, oftentimes these are incredibly high resource, uh, highly, uh, highly resource intensive procedures. Follow up care is highly resource intensive. It has a lot to the stress and the challenges in the children's center. So those are just a few things that I hope we get a chance to talk about today. I can't wait to hear your input. But first, let's start with our panel. Eric Dillon is a pediatric surgeon and does a lot of the work with uh, congenital diaphragmatoprenia and some of the fetal therapy programs. Really a, a, a fascinating innovator with a really, I think, an expansive view of what this is all about. Next is Sue Barker, who is a social worker in the PICU, where she works hard with families who are sort of receiving innovative care and helping them to understand what's happening and what's happening next. Next we have Mela Van Bay. Mela is here. Mela is a PICU doc who actually specializes in ECMO. And ECMO is a really remarkably innovative therapy that sometimes we have you know, protocols for, but it's really one of, the, one of the tools that we have to rescue in the children's center. So often it's, it's implemented in, when there's a need for heroic care, which makes sometimes it very innovative, very much, it's not standard care, it's not research, it's really a response to an immediate need. Emily Johnson is a PICU nurse, she's also a, a, a palliative care nurse, nurse practitioner, excuse me, with a very strong background in ethics, and also works closely with these families um, in the PICU. And at the end of the table is Renee Voss. Renee is also faculty in the Burma Institute of Bioethics. She's a neonatologist and um, works closely with the palliative care program as well, has this um, 
some insights into the, the, some of the ways that we design innovative care. So at this point, I'm going to stop and I'm going to open it. I think Eric, I'm going to see if people on the panel would like to make some opening statements, and then we'll open it for discussion. Thank you. Eric. Hi, so thanks very much, uh, Maggie. Uh, I'm Eric Jellen. I'm the director of the Children's Center uh, Fetal Program. I'm a pediatric surgeon. Uh, I'm really proud to have been a part of uh, a lot of initiatives that we've embarked upon here at the Children's Center um, that have to do with innovation. Um, but I also uh, recognize that it's an incredibly layered uh, discussion about all of the various initiatives that we've undertaken. Um, and there are so many different layers that it's hard to even uh, specify one and say this is the most important. There's the you know, just individual uh, layer of, of talking to a family about what's best for their baby or their child. There's the layer of you know, communication between caregivers. There's a layer of uh, resource allocation. There's a layer of um, reasonable care. Uh, and I think all those things are worthy of discussion, and I think it's incredibly important that we have uh, multidisciplinary meetings like this as part of our efforts so that, that we can innovate responsibly. Hi, um, I'm a social worker at the FAQ. Um, what I find so challenging in this arena is that with innovation, you're offering parents who are in uh, often a place of despair and um, desperation a avenue or a procedure or a new uh, treatment that we really don't have a lot of, I would say, research on at the moment. We don't know what the outcome is always going to be, but if you offer any parent hope, even if it's a tiny, tiny bit of hope, the parent will take that. Um, it, it can be an incredible journey for them. It can be a positive journey, but it can also be a very negative journey. Um, they spend it changes their relationships at home. It changes work relationships. They now live in our ICU. Um, and if anybody has worked there knows that's not a fun place to be uh, 24 hours a day, week after week. So that's a challenge that I find is how we communicate with parents the reality of these new uh, in, in innovations and interactions and helping them make decisions that are really Hi, um, I'm Anna Bebe. I'm a pediatric intensivist uh, here at Hopkins, and I'm the medical director of the Neonatal and Pediatric Medical Program. Um, as Dr. Lynn uh, mentioned, um, with um, ECMO, which stands for Extra Oral Methane Oxygenation, um, it's a method of life support for patients who have such severe cardiac and respiratory failure that they cannot be supported by conventional means. We sort of sit at the intersection of all the different services in the children's center and beyond, um, as we oftentimes also support hospitals in the community um, in Maryland um, and adjoining states. Um, so yeah, so we sit at the intersection of, of all these different um, services and providers uh, where we serve as, um, in, in some ways, as a backup um, for some of the procedures, some of the interventions um, that are high risk, um, but that are offered to families when their children are um, are dying, essentially. Um, so I look forward to to your discussion today. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm a nurse practitioner with the palliative care team, and I've embedded within the ICU. Um, tagging on to much of what Sue said, I think one of my biggest challenges is how do we support um, families the best we can within the spectrum of uncertainty. Um, we're better at finding short-term goals, what we can do minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day, but when kids' hospitalizations extend, extend down to months, even to years, um, trying to define and grapple with the parents' questions of long-term goals is really hard because we don't have all the answers. We have less information than we do on a normal basis which um, can be really hard to give parents the information that they need to make good decisions. Um, so I think, as to was saying, it's a really stressful journey for these families in many ways, and the stakes are really too high for these families and for these patients um, to navigate it alone. So as surgery changes and things, um, we're doing things better, um, we also need to figure out how to support families.
Hello, I'm Renee Voss. I'm a neonatologist here, and um, I certainly concur with all of my colleagues here about these challenges. I think that others have already spoken quite clearly about what some of the challenges are at the bedside working with these patients and families. So let me step back a little bit and say that uh, as I think about this issue of innovative therapies, whether they're surgery or others, there are sort of the issues that arise at the bedside. There are issues that arise between us as teams in terms of communication and decision making and sharing responsibility and um, being leaders of teams. So uh, it poses uh, different challenges for us. And then I think that there are sort of hospital and system wide issues in terms of conflicts of interest. Um, Hopkins is known for innovation and wants to be known for innovation. So what sort of pressures are there in terms of hiring of people who are likely to do innovative things? Um, those of us who might be innovating have conflicts of interest because we want to do the things that we are trying to innovate about. So um, I think that leads to questions about who should be doing consent with these families and what does it mean to give informed consent when the outcomes are really unknown. So I think there are Aside from uh, the, the at the bedside in the moment, individual patient and family issues, there are definitely some system issues. And I would step back even from the hospital and say that the broader system is the social system. And so how about issues of access and justice? Um, you know, I sort of think about, I've had some experience now working with some of the families who have been through the CDH protocol, and you know, not every family is equal. So some families are well-resourced and come from down the street and have lots of supports, and some families are um, have don't have transportation and don't have uh, health literacy and don't have any family supports, and should we be making equal offers to those families? So I think there's a broader social issues as well where we need to think about who does have access to these innovative therapies and uh, how can we how can we help to direct that access in a way that makes more sense. Thank you very much. So I think that this uh, our panel is wonderful because they right. give you sort of a range of oh, sorry. Our, our panel will give you sort of a range of what is happening in the world of innovation. And I just, again, want to sort of emphasize that innovative care is care that's not standard. It's often rescue care or sort of experimental care, but it's not yet sort of research. So it's in this sort of interesting and, and gray arena between standard care and care that we've decided is likely to be effective enough to actually initiate as a research protocol. So you can sort of get the sense of the tension that we're often implementing an approach to innovative care in with the notion of rescue, right? In a time when there's really nothing else we have to offer. And then sometimes, as with the field therapy program, it really come, becomes well established enough to become research protocols. And it sort of opens itself up into the way that we conduct research in, the, in this institution. But this art of this paper from the American Academy of Pediatrics really focused on the, the one thing that we're trying to get done here today. It's the importance of making sure that the community is aware of this sort of, of our approach to innovation. It's if the importance of having a wide ranging discussion of what it is we're trying to get done and how we're approaching it. So I have a lot of admiration, I think, for Eric and the fetal therapy program who's been trying to really create a, a children's center wide discussion of what's happening with the fetal therapy program. I think it's a real model for what we're trying to get done. But I know from wandering around the hallways of this wonderful place that there's an undercurrent of anxiety sometimes about what we're doing, about what, how we're doing it, what we're trying to get done. And that's what I'm really hoping we can address a little bit today and have a, a better understanding of how we approach some of these issues. So I would love to open it now to comments or questions from our group, from the audience. I am Norm Romer. I'm one of the ICU attendings and have been um, partnering and providing care for pulmonary hypertension and some of the patients who have benefited from the innovative uh, programs that Dr. John has had in the Children's Center. Um, have a very high level of appreciation of, for all of the professionalism that's been brought to bear from multidisciplinary. 
uh, directions to take care of these very, very challenging children. Um, I guess my major question coming here today for the panel regards priority E on the list of discussion topics that Dr. Moon circulated, which is regarding resources. In my mind, what we're doing here is an interesting nexus of a research collaboration and a clinical resuscitation scenario. In the research collaboration field, if I'm getting ready to put in a large grant, I sit down with the leaders of those disciplines that I need to help me to achieve my goal, and we talk about the resources that everyone needs and what they're bringing to the table and implications that I, as the principal investigator, may not have seen when I first conceived of the idea. I think that model is an essential piece of the template for making programs in innovative pediatric surgery a success. The other piece is getting ready for resuscitation. So we have or procedure in the OR, in the ICU, in the delivery room, where we have a concept called a timeout, where we speak as a interdisciplinary professional group about problems, rules, and specifically what it is we're trying to get done. Again, it's an opportunity to bring together a collaborative, and therefore, I think, much greater than the sum of the parts, kind of a vision of what it is we're about. And both of those activities, I think, cause us to rise to our highest level of idealism and visionary thinking to try to make the very best long and short-term outcomes for the patients that we're trying to help. So I wonder if the panel could relate to those two models, how they have or have not come into the planning of innovative pediatric surgery programs to date and specifically to the issue of unforeseen impact on children's center resources. So um, I sort of uh, take the first stab at that. Um, in terms of uh, the concept of the sort of timeout and, and being as prepared as we can be, uh, we've instituted uh, a now weekly meeting where um, all of the fetal interventionists, all of the pediatric subspecialties um, that are involved um, in neonatal care for some of our fetal patients, and a lot of the social workers and um, geneticists and all, all the various disciplines that are involved in these cases, learn about them in advance and get a global view of what's happening. And everybody's there and can talk about what the plan should be and how each pregnancy should be managed and how the plan should be when the baby is born. And that's kind of our version of preparation and doing a, a multidisciplinary timeout early on um, so that everybody gets on the same page, everyone's voice can be heard. Um, and we, we don't get blindsided by a, a kid with a plan that we've never heard about. We have a lot of room to improve that meeting and, and we're working on that, but that, that's sort of our initiation of that. We also have a, a dedicated a multidisciplinary CDH meeting um, and uh, to address uh, issues of diaphragm hernia. Um, in terms of resource allocation, it's a very broad question. Um, you know, one could make the argument um, that a lot of what we do is, um, you know, the dollars would be better spent in other areas of healthcare. Um, or other areas uh, of the world um, where there are fewer resources. But um, that's not a choice we're being presented with. It's not, it's not as though we can withhold care from patient X who comes before us with a, a, a condition that we have therapy for um, and we don't know if it's going to work or not, but, but it's, it's a very reasonable thing to try. Um, we don't know that we can just transfer that money over to patient Y you know, in some resource um, poor environment and get them help. What, what might happen is 
you know, that, that money just doesn't go to healthcare. It goes to, you know, the defense budget or, you know, some, some other uh, area. So that's, that's a social question that's, that has to do with, you know, resources that are, um, I think, above our pay grade as clinicians with a sick patient in front of us. That's something that I think we, we have to address at the ballot box more than in the clinic. I don't know if that, you know, directly addresses your question about resources, but that's my global view of it. Thank you. Um, I think yeah. I'm going to push back on actually something you said, Maggie. So innovation, where, what is the distinction between innovation and research? Because research, we have particular ways we go about it. There are protocols that are followed. There's very detailed consenting. The implications are discussed. And if we're trying to figure out whether something works or not, that's where we are, and that's the comment you just said, then that's research. If we have something we think works, then it's made a brand new technique, but we, we think it works. So then that's innovation. We're bringing something new to this place that somebody else has proven or we're doing. Uh, otherwise, it's research that we're testing. Where are we here? Well, we're, we're, there, there are protocols that we do um, that are research. Most of what we do is active research. Um, you know, the every protocol we do in the um, fetal program, along with the Center for Fetal Therapy um, in the Division of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology, is an IRB approved uh, protocol for which there have been multiple, multiple, um, multidisciplinary discussions, approval, consent forms. I think a key aspect um, of us having this conversation is dispelling some of, I think, the myths that, that unfortunately get uh, understandably propagated about um, what happens at the prenatal uh, level. We have an extremely um, robust counseling uh, infrastructure where we portray in, in as detailed a fashion as we possibly can to its families who are in these incredibly difficult situations what we expect life to be like if things work or if they don't work. And um, the consent process, for example, for our uh, CDH program, this is a research protocol that is uh, under IRB and FDA uh, guidance that um, is a part of a multi-center uh, trial um, and we, that's definitely research. Um, where we get into innovation, I think, is when we're encountering a case we've never seen before. Um, and we think about the techniques that we have and whether or not we can see a conceptual benefit for that patient. And then um, we, we try to inform them as best we can, but I mean, we obviously don't know. No one's seen it before. So in that scenario, it becomes that's when we're in our innovation paradigm that Dr. Jim described it. Dr. Bustin, I could just add to that. Um, what I see happening as a new ecologist is that they're basically what we embark on when we have, for instance, the fetal therapy patients, although they're not all fetal therapy patients, the ones that get innovation in our um, Thank you. But the point being that it's really a journey of innovation that I think these kids get. It's not like one specific therapy. Because everything that happens after the innovation is also innovative because it's never been tried for a kid like this before. So I think the important thing for all of us in the room is to think about what our role is in offering further innovations to these patients who come in, say, on the CDH protocol. So are we going to offer ECMO to these children? Are we going to offer um, months of paralysis and uh, you know intensive therapies? Are we what is our plan as the extended team in terms of responding to uh, what happens after the initial innovation? I'm Ira Barkowitz, I'm one of the PEAC intensivists, and I guess my comment connects up with a bunch of what Steve said previously. I'm, I'm sort of really interested in, in the sort of issue of a knowledge asymmetry between the healthcare team and the patients, particularly or, you know, manifesting most intensively with the sort of consent program. Uh, you know, in, and, and how do we deal with the issue of trying to tell these patients what it's really going to be like spending six months in an ICU, nine months in an ICU, some of the real agenesis children. 
you know, being dialyzed for years before they get a, a renal transplant. And, and it, um, you know, from working in an ICU and having sort of informal, you know, conversations with colleagues, you'll often hear um, folks say, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have put their child through something like this. And, um, you know, it makes me think back I don't know how many years this is, maybe 10 or, 10 or 12, 10, 15 years ago, some of the studies that were done with uh, family, well, with caretakers and families of children with um, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, which is sort of in this category of, you know, at that time it was sort of innovative therapy and uh, certainly mortalities were much higher <coughs> a decade ago than they are now. But, uh, Alexander Kahn did a, a, really in, a couple of interesting studies where he basically, in summary, you know, he asked different groups of caretakers. He asked cardiac surgeons, cardiologists, intensivists, pediatricians. If this was your child, sort of, what would you do? And, you know, in spite of the fact that many cardiologists and heart surgeons and intensivists were sort of recommending the, the new innovative surgical technique, <coughs> techniques to these families, they themselves said if they had a child or, or <coughs> a child like this, they, they wouldn't proceed down the death path and they would sort of provide comfort care. So this is where I sort of struggle with some of what we see. And I just, how do you sort of think about that? And then, I don't know if this is an answer to your question, but one of the things that I have found interesting with families, and I'm going to talk about the CDH families because that's the ones I follow. <coughs> I think when they first come into the unit and their baby's a couple days old, a week old, they can talk to you very realistic. They still have this objectivity about their baby that they were very much told by Dr. Jalen that this is a risky procedure, the outcome may be poor, and they can actually have a dialogue about if this doesn't work out, that they can, they can they understand that. They understand the risk. But as this baby continues to live another week, and another week, and now suddenly they've been here a month, and they've been here two months, that objectivity is gone. And those parents are willing to do anything and everything to um, have their baby continue to live. And then that's where I find the challenges start with the med with our team and, and the multidisciplinary approach to those children, because then all of a sudden we have found, we had children on the unit for six months and a year and a year and a half. So, you know, it's an evolution I find with these kids the longer they're with us, and that is what I think challenges us so much. If I could add, so um, there are not a lot of data on your question right now, specifically related especially to fetal therapies, but there's a group in Seattle who's um, put out a couple of papers from the same survey, and um, there's also a group in, I think it's Chicago, that basically went to um, social media and looked to see what was being written about, about fetal therapy. So it's a select group of families who are writing about this, meaning that it's families who would take to social media to write about this. But um, John Lantos and others published a paper a few months ago making it clear that um, they basically pulled out all the text they could find related to fetal therapy on social media, and it was overwhelmingly positive. So families, no matter what the outcome was, I don't regret it. I would have done it anyway. I would have, you know, you know, I would have always taken that chance. I know I did the best thing I possibly could for my child. Um, so we can have a longer discussion about the um, the methodology and basically the biases of social media and sort of what you post versus what you really feel. I get all that. Um, but in a sort of vacuum of information from families, we do have that piece of information. And well, going back to Dr. Berkowitz's example of hypoplastic left heart syndrome, um, that's sort of a classic example for us in pediatric critical care medicine where many years ago when these um, operations were first performed, the rate of mortality was almost, almost close to 100%. And it was the case for, for a number of years, after which the, the surgical techniques got better, the pulmonary bypass got better, um, providers became more experienced um, to the point where, um, in this day and age, the 
national reported mortality after a normal procedure, which is the first stage in these operations, is as low as 12.5%. Um, so, and, and many of these children go on to have subsequent surgeries, but many of them go on to have to reach adulthood, to go to college, to have um, very good lives uh, where they, they do not sit in the ICU and they, they don't constantly need medical care. Um, so uh, this is what makes these types of interventions also very difficult once you, once you have a baby that was born um, whose mom consented <coughs> and wanted this procedure done while the baby was in utero, it's hard not to look at the baby in front of you the same way that you would look at any other baby who was just born with that disease. And so the types of procedures, the types of care that you would offer the family, these families are exactly the same as you would offer to, to any other child because we just don't know what the outcome of these procedures will be. And there is a chance that they're going to be better. There's also a chance that they may not, um, but time, time will tell um, if they are or not. I just want to uh, respond specifically to what you said about the asymmetry of knowledge. I think that that's an incredibly important point. Um, and we always have to mitigate that as best we can by uh, providing multidisciplinary consults if necessary, by giving the patient as much time as is reasonable given whatever the condition is. This applies not to, not just to uh, perinatal decisions, but to decisions that occur for all of our patients in the pediatric world for any surgery, we're always going to know usually more than the patients. And we have to do our best to transmit realistic viewpoints about what could happen. Now the other thing that I think is critical to mention in regards to what you said about providers not being willing to do the same therapy for their kids that they're offering, um, I, I think that has to do with patient autonomy. Um, and you know, you, you get a, a select group of physicians who are educated in a certain way and see a lot, and, and they have a view that that is probably not reflective of the population in general. Um, and the way I think about my counseling is I try to be as non-directive as possible um, and non-paternalistic as possible. So um, within the scope of what's legal, um, you know, I don't. Um, judge anyone for wanting to terminate for no reason before 24 weeks, um, or uh, judge anyone for wanting to resuscitate a very sick baby who um, has a very you know, small chance of survival, but a non-zero chance. Um, and even if I personally would, would you know, terminate for a, you know, a gastrosthesis, that doesn't mean that I'm gonna, I'm gonna try not to let that bleed over into my counseling about what life is like for the patients that I know that have gastrosis. Um, those are my thoughts. Julia, yeah. Hi, my name is Julia Dotson. I'm the neonatologist. Um, I wanted to just revisit the uh, earlier point made about resource allocation. And Dr. <coughs> Dell spoke to um, healthcare dollars being spent and how we can't just think about them being transferred. But one thing that I have seen, and I know I'm very junior to a lot of people in this room, but over the period of years as we continue to innovate is that the strain on the system has increased in terms of what the census is, how long patients are staying, and certainly the types of patients that we take care of in the you and the thank you has changed. And I just wonder if any of you have thoughts as how, as these services continue to grow, as we have more patients traveling from far distances receiving these services, um, how do we as a system accommodate that? Do we, I know the thank you is expanding for beds soon, but um, you know, rather than crowding out our usual deliveries, we're still a delivery hospital, but do we still have room for patients like that when we're continuing to have patients that are staying in the hospital longer and are sicker? So I can, can we come up here, I can answer part of that, because it's a really important question. Um, one of the things, I think this, this notion of, we want to be a hospital that, that fosters innovation, how do we make that work, given that we're also a hospital that has to do with <coughs> care and takes care of community children, and what is the, how do we make all that work together? And I think it's never been easy, and I think Dr. Johnson is right that in the last five years, let's say, 
the strain on the, uh, on the hospital environment has been really noticeable. And one thing that we sort of learned is that maybe we weren't doing a great job at predicting what sort of high resource utilizing procedures were coming down the pipe. So we've tried to get better at that. I think sit with Dr. Rashad and Dr. Jalen and like, what's coming? What do you anticipate in the next 12 months? What about the next three years? Is there something that we should be preparing the institution for? <clears throat> Taking it to the hospital administration and saying, this is happening to us. We have more children who are chronically critically ill. We don't currently have a plan for caring for these. So let's, can we, can you help us support some innovative work in sort of how we even approach the care of these children. So I think that message has because is being heard loud and clear. I don't have an easy answer to it, but I'm, I'm confident that there's a lot of people in this institution who are incorporating that into long, short-term and long-term planning about what we intend to do as an institution. So I, you know, I wish there was an obvious path, but I think I'm happy to say that it really is part of the discussion at all levels of the Children's Center and in the hospital also, and the institution wide. And I think Dr. Bishat, oh, go ahead and that. Sorry, no, I was just going to um, compliment um, what uh, Dr. Moon was just saying, which is that this is not an issue that's unique to Hopkins. This is an issue that's been, um, over the last several years, starting to be reported by essentially every tertiary and quaternary hospital in this country and Canada. Um, and starting to be reported more and more in Europe um, and Australia. So this is not something that's unique to us as an institution. Um, and, uh, and as our experience grows with how to allocate these types of resources and how to accommodate for the growth, um, I believe we can learn from other hospitals too that are going through the same um, process. And part of it is also understanding there are some types of innovation we should say no to, right? And that is a really difficult challenge. Dr. Bishop. I think I'm going to just say two things. First, just to your comment, I think it needs to be also recognized that up until a recent time ago, Maryland residents, residents from the neighborhood here, um, would go to other states as far as Texas, you know, to get treatments that some may consider innovative, but that actually have been on the people therapy you know, treatment agenda for many, many years. And these patients still have to go there now. So that's actually a change for residents. And I think, if you think about, um, I think it's unfair for the institution to carry the responsibility for that alone without passing some of that onto the legislation. And there is a powerful time to argue that it's actually um, I think the other thing that I just want to bring up about the patient counts, you know, patients are extremely varied, and what you're describing that somebody would recommend a treatment but wouldn't have it themselves, that's, that's typical of patients. And, you know, we have, um, that's why, for example, in some states where um, some, you know, religious ethnicities, you know, state, uh, um, laws regarding termination of pregnancy essentially prohibits that pathway that those are the busiest field therapy centers that exist in the whole country, right? So um, <coughs> some of that is the background where patients come from. And one of the challenges that I think we face and that's alleviated by a multidisciplinary discussion that you can give the patients as much information as you can, but once they make a decision, it's their family decision that they have to make, and then it's their journey, and we observe that over and over again, that for some that journey goes where they expected it, and some it turns into a, 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 a direction where they didn't expect it, and we need to just stick with it. You know, we can't abandon Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. I think one of the challenges in pediatric decision making <coughs> overall is the fact that we're not actually talking about autonomy here. This is a different situation. This is people making decision for another person. Parents making a decision for a child is not actually the model of autonomy. So I think one of the one of the pieces that I've, I've become distressed about in, in these cases um, is when it feels like 
um, we've sort of gotten on this train of the, the parents. It, it's sort of what you talked about, too. It's, it's in the first few weeks that families often do seem um, often fairly realistic about the fact that this may not go well and that their child may not survive. But then once they have survived for two, three, four weeks, um, often it ends up in, uh, we often end up in conflict with the family and there's concern about uh, who's, making the, who's making a good decision. And whether we know what's best for this uh, patient based on what we would do for our own children or the parent knows what's best, I don't know. Um, in some cases, I feel like there should be yet another outside child advocate sometimes uh, to become involved and think about it because I'm not sure any of us are thinking clearly about what is best because we all have emotional ties to what's going on here. So um, I, I just want to say that one of the challenges of this decision making is that it's really not just about the parent and the doctor, it's about the parent, the doctor, and the child. I, I want to just um dovetail a little bit with what Dr. Bashat said, um, and then also ask you a question, Renee. Um, so uh, in terms of these kids and their um, long-term stays in the hospital, that definitely is a uh, subpopulation of our, our patients that we do innovative therapies on or research on. Um, and we counsel as best we can for that, and some of the patients actually don't survive, um, so it's even um, you know, some might say it's better or worse than that. Um, but there's a, a large population of these kids that actually do great um, that we don't necessarily see. Um, or I should say that not everybody in the PICU or in the acute hospital gets to see them. I'm, I'm lucky because I see them on a longitudinal basis. I'll just use the CDH clinic as an example. So I, I see all of our um, CDH patients that get intervention or don't get intervention prenatally in a follow-up clinic, and there's, you know, I would say um, you know, 75 to 80 percent of the patients that we've seen prenatally um, are out there doing great, and, and it's, it's incredibly rewarding to, to see those patients do well. And I think one of the things that, that I should probably do to, to make this more clear is, is give more feedback to the providers who don't see those kids in, in the long term. Because it, it's it, it brings it home that, that, at least for this intervention, there's a lot of good that we're doing. Um, and there's a lot of families that are very, very satisfied, not just the ones that are posting on uh, Facebook and Twitter, but, but the ones that we're seeing in the clinic. Um, and I just want to ask Renee just one question. If, I, I get that it's the, the mom, the dad, the kid, and the doctor, but I tend to think of the family as a autonomous unit. Um, and maybe that's not the way that the ethicists think about it, but um, I'm just, I don't really understand how you cannot, or, or how one would deprive the family of, of some degree of autonomy. So I'm, I don't feel like I am suggesting that we deprive the family of autonomy, and I think that it is also true that in pediatric ethics we agree that the decision is not solely about the child, but it is in fact about the family. Um, but in sometimes in these cases, it becomes all about the family and very little about the child during these prolonged stays. And I think that in those situations, um, that's very distressing. And uh, you know, there's it, to the point about how could we ever counsel families, I, I don't know what the solution to that is. All I know is I see it happening again and again. So we've spent a fair amount of time really talking about medical indications for using certain therapies. And I, I think it's important to recognize that the people who implement those decisions are the nurses. And they are the ones who are the closest proximity to witnessing the impact on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm wondering about um, how we think about um, you talked about your multi-specialty conversation. To what extent is the experience and um, wisdom of people at the front lines being incorporated into those conversations? And how do we create systems that support the people who are delivering that care when they have conflicts about the balance of benefits and burdens and how they are 
seeing themselves as actually uh, perhaps contributing to that by the things that they're doing on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So how do we create a system where those issues can actually be addressed proactively um, as they are unfolding? What, what thoughts do you have on that? I'll just, I'll just answer uh, from a, a practical point of view. So nursing is, a, is I should have mentioned this, is a key facet of our multidisciplinary meeting. So you know the um, nurses and the social workers um, who are you know the uh, foot soldiers on the ground dealing with these folks are all invited to our meeting and often attend. Um, now not every nurse attends. We usually get a nurse leader um, who comes. So having them at the table, I think, is the first step to. To, uh, including them in a proactive way. Um, and uh, beyond that, um, having support for the, the nurses and, and making sure that we recognize exactly what you're saying, which is that the largest burden falls upon them, um, and making sure that they're on board with what's going on and checking in with them and treat, treat them as a, a critical part of the team. Um, but I'm interested in what other people yeah, I think um, information sharing is, that's really well. um, is a big part of it. It's a good first step. But at the same time, I think there is also a lot of brushing the distress of the bedside provider underneath the table. That because the patient comes first and then the family comes second, sometimes even first, that is always the focus. That it's not our decision as a healthcare provider. It's not our values. We have biases, and this isn't really about us. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that what the bedside providers are feeling isn't real. And that it's also not painful and distressing. So I think part of it, too, is just recognizing that it, that is there and it exists. And that it's also a priority to take care of your staff um, just as much as it is to take care of the patients and the family. Um, a lot of times, you can just, I get snagged a lot for one-on-one -on -one sessions and just being able to check in and figure out where things, um, how things are going and what we can do to make it better. Um, or even if we can't make it better, just to say, hey, yeah, I know this is really hard and you're not alone, um, but that's really hard to do on a grand scale that can actually make a different for, difference for a large staff. I would say also that one of the challenges that comes up with taking care of these kids is it really magnifies the divisions that we have in our institution by silos. So that Cardiologists have their own whole system, and the neurologists have their own whole system, and the nephrologists, and the neonatologists, and um, within those systems there's doctors, and RTs, and nurses, and social workers, and there's so many silos convening on this one very sick patient that what we seem to do traditionally here, although this meeting is an example of something different, um, is we also educate in silos, um, and we debrief often in silos. So uh, one of the things that um, I have personally been working on is trying to figure out how can we, how can we provide more education and support that crosses these silo barriers so that we can um, come together in rooms like this with people who have different viewpoints um, and learn more together about what our goals are for these kids. Uh, David Hackman, uh, yeah, so, Chief. so just a, a comment about the resource before you that. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Moon and Dr. Boss and, and uh, Dr. Yellen and the team. Uh, this is just so important and timely. Probably overdue, and we look forward to the next one, not just from the free lunch, but because of the <laughs> share of the free lunch, and there's no free lunch. Which gets me to the second point. The resource piece, just really fast. Um, it, it's important that we communicate that this should not be seen as a zero-sum game. That because we're taking care of these really sick children and offering either innovative or investigational, but nevertheless expensive care, that someone at the other side of the spectrum who is out to receive routine care is not getting access to that care. And as an institution, it's really important to communicate that we, we ensure whenever possible that, it, that the resources are there without compromising care and other ends of the mission. And in fact, the opposite is the case, that when we go to our payer, which is, which is our legislature, this is an example of truly innovative care for which additional compensation is required. And we're, we're having some traction with that argument. But it's not just about the money, because we can put money in and expand the PICU and expand the NICU. Our most precious resource is the nurse, and is the social worker, and is the is the frontline 
uh, provider without whose input and feedback and, uh, and uh, job satisfaction there is no program. And so we are being very proactive around that. And whether it's uh, a matter of ensuring that the staffing ratios are appropriate or that there are support structures in the PICU and outside the PICU, in the NICU and outside the NICU, please know that's part of every single conversation. And it's not that we've solved it yet, but please know that it is an absolute priority because that is the true resource that we need to maximize delivery. Um, I have a question. Do you have a question for We got approval from the IRB 
um, to move forward with very strict inclusion exclusion criteria, which included uh, mandatory counseling for the families, included issues of financial risk, issues of distributive justice, issues of uh, all kinds of things. Again, you know, that it, it, it took a while, it took a year to get approval. Um, but we said no to the Emmy Award because we're not, we don't, we don't we think that's putting the cart before the horse. That's a human experimentation. The animal studies haven't been done um, in that field yet, or with that uh, instrument yet. And the FDA hasn't approved use of that instrument in pregnancy. So it's not as though we're just doing everything we can, because we can. We, we have a very thoughtful and deliberative process about it um, that tries to engage as many stakeholders as possible. Um, and I think sometimes people are just so busy that it's hard to, to engage and that it feels like it came out of nowhere. But, but I promise you that from our perspective, we're, we're committed to um, following the process, dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's with both our IRB, the FDA, and the community. Hi. I wondered, I think the biggest challenge to might be the informed consent aspect for the short term and long term long-term part of the journey. Have you any sense of, if you were to ask families after that, six months out, how to, would they do it again? And how effective do you feel like you've been in informing them of the short-term and the long-term um, challenges, for instance, of the congenital um, diaphragmatic hernia population? I'll say in general that um, it's really difficult to do meaningful communal counseling um, for anything. <laughs> I mean, I do a lot of communal counseling, and I'm very humbled by my inability sometimes to communicate meaningfully because, I mean, it's a little bit what Ivor talked about. It's, you know, I'm communicating what's meaningful to me. Um, I don't know what's necessarily uh, meaningful to them. We all have different communication skills here. Some of us uh, are more likely to get more information from the family about what they think and feel. Um, some of us don't get any at all. So uh, I think in general that is a question that we don't really know the answer to. And, I, and I'm not sure how we ever would do it well, right? So I counsel a lot of families who are about 10 to 23, 24, 25 weaker. Um, how do I really communicate to them what it's really going to be like to take home a child, maybe with a G-tube, and, and you know something that's three months down the road, especially with the looming decision that's about today, right? There's this looming decision, and with the fetal therapy patients, there's often a looming, time-sensitive decision that's overwhelming, that involves crossing state borders, it involves getting off work, it involves insurance, it involves this complicated counseling two, three day process. Um, and so to meaningfully communicate to people what's downstream three, four, or five months ahead, um, I'm not sure we know how to do that. And, and I don't know what, uh, there are no data to suggest that we do that very well for any case. I think it, it, if you could get the funding, it would be interesting to get to a documentary of a range of scenarios and interview if people have had the courage to come forward and say, this is how I felt going into it, this was my experience, I'm glad we did it. And then for those people, say there was a bad, there was a demise, to really share with people the whole range of the roller coaster so that they could watch this. It could take almost an hour, half hour, and then maybe it's already been done. But I think that you have to do this over time and, and actually ask the parents. Okay, I think we're almost out of time. Um, Dr. McCloskey, and then, um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but let's finish up with those two comments. Okay. John McCloskey, I'm the Division Director of Pete's Anesthesia and Critical Care Medicine. I have a lot to say. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, the University of Kansas has done this with pediatric transplants and exposed families to good ones and bad ones. And they're, after doing that, there are half the families will say, no, we won't go through this. Because pediatric transplant, or uh, lung transplant, I should say, lung transplant, specifically, is very, the outcomes are not that great. On the other hand, we are at Hopkins, okay, we are innovators. Um, you know, 
speaking of high plastic glass, when I was an intern in the NICU many years ago, here, we sent the kids home. We didn't offer them surgery. You, you know, you have, you have lethal terminal disease, so high plastic left heart, and they all went home. Now we have kids that are running around in the world into childhood. Um, and again, speaking with, when I was a fellow back in the day, I worked in the late 80s and 90s, many of the kids we take care of in the ICU now, or, or back then, you know, they died, and now they survive. Um, and sometimes when I take care of kids in, in the big I see all the work we put into them, and like, think about how it was back in, in the day, these kids would never survive, but we do it, and there are miracles that happen every day. So if we don't innovate, but do it reasonably, and with good forethought, and good education, and, and with preparation of the families, then you know, we can do something great. The other thing, too, is again, speaking to that degree in terms of change in critical care medicine, we're keeping kids much longer, much, uh, much longer with lethal disease, or terminal disease, or I should say chronic illness. And so, our thought process in the PICU has to change completely. It's not two or three days in the PICU, you either you get better or you die. Now it's weeks to months where kids can survive and go home and have productive lives. But then the whole thought process of the staff has to go out the short-term kids that do well and the long-term kids that we gotta take our time with and just hang in there and persevere. And we've talked about this and trying to create a different area in terms of the chronically critically ill child. And my former institution, the CEO back then, said, you know, where we're moving in pediatrics is like CHOP was going to become a giant PICU eventually, because that's where we're heading with kids in terms of care in the hospital. Yeah, thank you. And one thought comment I'd like to close up. Hello, I'm Gina Miller. I'm the other faculty member in the Center for Field Therapy. I just want to comment on your, um, about the consent process. So if you take CEH patients, for instance, you might find that diagnosis 20, 21 weeks. A uh, balloon for tracheal occlusion is placed at 27 weeks. So for instance, for one of the highest impact conditions that we offer fetal treatment, that is a several week process for consideration. And so the entry may begin in our, in our center and with our initial counseling, but we, high, we strongly lean on all of our pediatric care providers as well to meet with them on an individual basis. The surgeon, the NICU, the PICU, they meet with Dr. Rivea to discuss ECMO. And our families are, who have been through this process are also really engaged on the other side. The network between these families who may embark on this journey has been tremendous and they are immediately available because there's something that's so important about that side of it that there's no possible way that we can prepare them. And particularly from our side, the pregnancy part, that's when the things are calm. You know, and we really prepare them as well as we can for the world that comes over. So by, by all means, I mean, this is a process of consent. It is not done over one day. Thank you. And I've it's been a really fabulous discussion. I think we are out of time. I just wanted to close with a couple of ideas. I want to thank our panel for such a wide range of ideas and articulate uh, presentations of sort of what's happening in their worlds. The take home points for me today is uh, one of this informed consent discussion is a really important one. In the IRB world, we try and emphasize that for complicated protocols, informed consent is not a one time thing, but it needs to go on and on and on. I think one of the things that's happening right now is with these. Uh, with innovation and with therapies that uh, leave children in the, in the ICUs for a long time, this notion of when it's okay to stop is probably something that we're not great at, right? So I think, and I think um, Renee said or Sue said it really clearly, like in the first two weeks or the first week, families are very concrete. And then they get filled with hope and this desire for that one more day. I think we as providers do exactly the same thing sometimes. I think sometimes uh, our nursing <coughs> colleagues are pushing back in the other direction. I think that that's where we run into uh, a failure of effective communication, not with between providers, between providers and families. So I'm hoping that as we move forward, you know, in the way that we innovate, that's something else we can innovate about and learn to be the best communicators in all the different directions that it has to happen. I think also I really appreciate this sort of discussion of what we're doing in the Children's Center. I think uh, this is a really, this, the community in this hospital is a very important community and it's, it's we're at our best 
and we convene to talk about difficult issues in a way that is open and, sh and create shared understanding. So I hope that we can do this again and again for challenges of innovation. I'm thinking about the Children's Center. It applies to the hospital as well. But I want to thank everybody for participating and, and expressing their comments and concerns so clearly. And again, join me in thanking our panel.